So here we are, Panasonic did release all the specificities of the upcoming GH5 firmware 2.0. This is indeed a major update, and as a Lumix ambassador, I have been able to install it into my GH5. I have not been able to test it yet, but I will next week in the south of Italy. So stay tuned because I will then do a sort of review and do some testing about that major GH5 update. And I will post it within a week from now, I guess. So here is a quick summary of what that 2.0 firmware does bring to the GH5. First of all, that was a surprise for me as I'm a professional photographer as well and I'm really used to work in studio with the camera connected to the computer. It will now be possible with the GH5 as well. Using the Lumix Teeter software that will work on both Mac and PC, I cannot wait to test that. Okay, so I'm gonna show you really quickly the Lumix Teeter software and as you see we have on the top corner Left, you have the live view, and it's actually live as you see, because you may ask if we can also trigger the video, and we can over there, we can trigger the mode video mode, or we can trigger for a picture. As you see, my, uh, my image is not focused. I can simply click exactly how I would on the LCD screen of the camera, and then you have, of course, this will show you where you did put your focus. This is the level, of course, the grid. You can also customize the grid. Okay. And you have the guidelines. You have the histogram. Okay. Everything is there into the live view window. And then I can trigger a picture. And into the settings, I can also choose here the storage location. I can decide that all the picture that I can shoot will be stored onto the SD card or both the SD card and the PC. And in my case, I did choose the PC only. I can then also choose the location on my hard drive and I can also create a subfolder. And this is exactly what I did. And it did use the date 31st of August, 2017. Okay, sort by uh, date subfolder. And uh, I can then here, of course, choose all my settings, the aperture, the shutter speed, and the white balance and ISO. In this case, I leave it uh, uh, in auto. I'm not using auto most of the time, of course, but in this case, just for the test, I leave it like that. And I can also turn the button on the top of the camera itself. And as you've seen, we have all the menu or mode uh, that we have on the camera that can also be changed there into, well, in, for this option, we, you have to uh, physically move the button, of course, and I can trigger the recording mode. I can choose uh, my, my recording settings, okay? And I can then also choose the photo style and I can trigger and I can check here that it's actually recording and of course I can do whatever I want to do now it's filming and I can of course trigger a picture perfect quality of course so uh, as you've seen you can also choose different uh, focus mode basically you can do everything you want to do or anything you would have done on the camera itself you, you can also do it straight from the lumix theater and i have to admit that it's pretty well done the way those little windows open the, the way i can uh, browse into it by using my trackpad is really really cool i have to say that the software looked pretty well done so this was a quick quick overview of that software and there's no doubt i'm gonna use it for sure so next, Panasonic did also an improvement into the autofocus performances. Next, they have improved performances into 6K photo and 4K photos. And there is, of course, the really expected all intra video recording mode. I will get back on this later on this video. The GH5 will be also able to record HDR 4K, and I'm really curious to see that. And for those of you who are shooting anamorphic, there is now a function that will help you to de-squeeze the image while recording and playing back. Panasonic also did enhance the body image stabilizer. To be honest, I'm also really curious to test that, as it was pretty amazing already. And they also had some function for the wireless system. As I said, I have not been able to do any testing yet, or should I say not willing to test it those days, as I knew that I would be traveling to Puglia in the south of Italy, where my mother is coming from. 
It's a fantastic region and I'm really excited to put that firmware on test over there. But for now, let's get back to some stuff. First of all, the autofocus have been improved. I guess it's good. To be honest, I didn't use the autofocus that much. I'm more using the manual focus all the time with the GH5. But anytime I had used the autofocus, I was pretty happy with it. If it works now even better, then fantastic, I guess. Besides this, for the beginners that are watching this video right now, I want to point out the technique we are using most of the time for a cinematographic look. I mount a follow focus on my rig and I pull focus this way. And this is the way we do most of the time. And basically what we do when we are shooting with a talent in front of the camera, we are following the talent by turning the wheel one side or the other in order to keep it in focus or in order to bring the attention of the viewer on another part of the image. And when on a specific action where the talent is going from point A to point B into the image, we may mark with a pen the point A and point B on the wheel itself. And I'm going to be following the subject movement into the image by turning the wheel from A to B. This is the main technique in cinematography. For doing this, you'll need a rig or at least a way to mount the follow focus into your GH5. But after doing some testing and getting some excellent result out of it, I'm more and more using that follow focus function that we have into the GH5. If you never use it or tested it, I assure you it's fantastic. Okay, it's not a physical or an organic move like the one we do with the follow focus, but who cares if it works? Let me show you one of the very first tests I did with my girlfriend at the park. I wanted to test that follow focus function exactly the way I would have done using the follow focus with it set a point A and a final point. So there is an A point and a B point and she is coming to the camera so the depth of the focus is pretty important and I did set the speed really approximately to medium speed. As you know that you are able to decide the speed, the camera will pass from one point to the other. And she was sharp at the beginning and sharp at the end and sharp all the way in between. It was really funny because that was my actual very first test with that function. So do I believe this function could replace the manual follow focus? Of course not. And it's not even supposed to. But on many cases, this is a fantastic tool as you will be able to set your focus extremely sharp and then trigger the focus to move by simply pushing a button. I have been playing a lot with that function, as on this other shoot I did. What I did in this case was to defocus completely the image in order to get that kind of organic silhouette of my model. Then I simply triggered the right focus to come back on her. And get that razor sharp image of her. I was then passing from a total blurred organic image of her to a razor sharp image of her again, still using the same right focus tool. It is super easy to use. So Panasonic did improve the autofocus performances into that 2.0 firmware. Fantastic. But keep in mind, or at least test the other way you'll have to set your focus. Some of you may also believe that the autofocus is also crucial when it comes to use the GH5 on a gimbal or a crane. And I would use the hyperfocal rule. Basically, that hyperfocal rule will help you to set the focus on a very specific distance, depending on your focal length and your aperture. From there, you will be able to totally control your depth of field and make sure your subject is on focus all the way. 
while following your subject with your GH5 on a Zion crane or something. You have many phone apps that can calculate that hyperfocal for you, or you could also go online and use one of those for free. You'll have to choose your camera, your focal length, your desired aperture, and the calculator will give you the depth of field you'll get. You can then tweak your settings, mainly by choosing a different aperture, and then shift your focus distance in order to get what we call the hyperfocal. Basically, it means that you will have to set your focus distance at a specific distance from your camera, at a specific aperture in order to get the maximum depth of field, or at least the depth of field you may need to make your subject remain in focus while you are following. And most of the time, to get that cinematic look, we are really trying to keep that aperture as wide as possible to reach that really narrow depth of field. But understanding the depth of field a little bit more mathematically will also help you to understand what's going on. And beside this, you will be able to control the desired depth of field you really need accurately. So it may sound a bit weird at the beginning, because sometimes you will have to push back your focus. It may even sound too far away from your subject proximity, but at the end, that will give you the best depth of field when you are using your gimbal, crane or whatever. Now let's get a closer look to all the new recording flavors Panasonic implement into that GH5. We had so far only the long up compression. We will have a lot more to choose from. Now that we have that 400 Mbps at all intra compression, at the chroma subsampling at 422 10-bit, even if the 400 Mbps all intra is for sure probably the most expected features of the firmware, there is still a lot of debate around the need and use of that recording mode because there will be a major difference in terms of disk space, for sure, and also SD card specificities. I will not go too much in detail there, but for those of you who don't have any idea about what a long gop or ultra compression is, let's put it this way. The camera has to compress the files in order to make it fit on the SD card or any kind of storage, basically. And the GOP word into the long GOP compression means group of pictures. The video codec uses two types of frames, intra codec or inter codec. Long GOP is a mix of those two. If the codec that is used is not the long GOP, then it's an intra only. And that leads to the all intra we will get now into the GH5. Here is an IPB structure. You have an iframe, also sometimes called a keyframe. Then the P stands for predictive, and we have the B, that stands for bidirectional. The B looks the frame before and the frame after, and that forms the IPB, a pretty simple group of pictures. A keyframe, a predictive frame, and a bidirectional frame. The GH4 was using IPB, but the GH4 real GOP structure was actually IBBP, an iframe followed by two directional frame and a predictive frame to close the GOP. The length of the GOP will be the number of frames that separate two keyframes. The number of frames in between two iframes. You could get IBBP, BBI, or IBBP, BBP, BBI, etc. Still a group of pictures, but obviously way longer. A 15 frame open GOP will have that structure. IBBP, BBP, 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 BB. This is 15 frames before the next I, and we have seen that those I frames can be considered in a way as a keyframe into our image video stream. So from there you understand that an all intra codec will give you only a suite of E frame. And this is what makes the difference already. When into an editing software, if you edit with an all intra files, no matter where you cut for instance, it will be in between two keyframes obviously. So there will be for sure a much more fluid editing process and playback when using an all intra footage. So for the editing, but also for playing back into the editing software, skimming into the timeline, etc. Rewarding the image quality itself, there is a lot of discussion around that topic. The long gop into the GH5 is doing an excellent job already. You have there an amazing image quality and the file size are not going crazy at all. You really need to keep that in mind when you'll be able to switch to all E, as there is no B or P frame into the video stream. The quality of fast motion images should improve theoretically. Fast motion, fire images, smoke, leaves from the tree, water splashes, stuff like that. As any individual frame will be a keyframe. I recently have had a talk with a friend, Nicolas, 
and soon after that talk he was on holiday in Greece and he did post a short clip he did when he was sailing on a boat and there was some dolphin jumping around the boat so a lot of fast water drops all over the frames and we were both surprised to see how good the GH5 long gob was in those kind of condition anyway so yes, for both the editing process and the fast motion images, the all intra should bring a lot. But beside that, think about your file size, as the long up is doing an excellent job. So I would suggest you to really think and choose your bitrate and codec based on your subject and the purpose of the video. I will put the video Nicola did with the dolphin shots into the video description below. I have not been able to really test any SD card for now, but this may be an issue as if you have no SD card fast enough for that 400 Mbps bitrate, you will just not be able to record. And those cards are pretty expensive. As we have said that all in try is probably for some real demanding production. And the recording format then is just a small part of the bigger process. And for those production using a super fast SD card or an Atomos recorder is just a detail most of the time. You will need for sure a super fast SD card. Panasonic recommend the UHS-2 V90 SD card. Now another pretty cool update is for sure that HDR 4K recording. We are getting closer to the human eye vision when shooting HDR. HDR stands for high dynamic range. Basically imagine you have a frame with some trees in the shadows and behind those trees you have a very bright sky. Your human eyes will be able to see much more details into both the trees and the sky than your camera on a standard picture style. Depending on the exposure settings you will get details on the trees and burn your sky or you will keep details on the sky and lose information on the trees. The HDR will indeed stretch the dynamic range to find a way in between and keep details on the sky and the trees. This is really kind of a shortcut to me to explain a bit. I will test this and show some samples in a week or two here on my YouTube channel. To be able to use that HDR function on the GH5, we will now find a new photo style. When you navigate into it, right after the like 7 or 9, you'll get the hybrid log gamma. HLG. This is the one you want to choose to get the HDR look. You will also see that depending on the recording format you choose, you will be able to record HLG Hybrid Log Gamma internally on your SD card. When choosing the brand new 4K 422 10-bit all E 400 Mbps, you will be able to go into that photo style and get the Hybrid Log Gamma. From there, the image will look a certain way, of course, but on top of that, if you are using an external video recorder such as the Ninja Inferno, you will be able to tweak a little bit more. By going into the HDMI rake output, you can then go to the HLG view assist and select auto or mode 2 or mode 1 or keep it off and get back to the HLG display. By selecting auto, I get a super sexy vivid contrasted image. Not saying that it is better or worse, in some cases, on some specific shoots, like a fantastic sunset on the other side of the planet on a beach, it may look fantastic. You may of course choose to keep it HLG display and the all the work in post-production of course. But it's interesting to know that we are able to do so. You may also choose to select MP4 HEVC as a record format. Then you'll be recording HDR on an external recorder. In this case, only one recording choice seems to be available. This is the 4K 420 at 10-bit with a bitrate of 72 Mbps on a long up codec. In this case, by definition, the only photo style available is the HLG. But you may still go into the HDMI record output and go to the HLG view assist to select auto mode, mode 1, mode 2 or the HLG display. And for those of you who are shooting anamorphic, you will be now able to disqueeze your image while shooting or for the playback. You will also be able to select video guidelines in order to see your 6x9 or 235 or 239. So that's about it for my overview of the 2.0 firmware. I never tried it on location yet, but as I said, I will really soon and will post some more tests here on this channel. So stay tuned. Thank you.